in June as a, as a makeup day for students and staff would not recommend doing away with that day since the teachers have already set exam schedules and for their purposes of their backward count, we need that day. So we are just looking for direction on how to deal with that fifth day that we lost due to snow. I said forgive it. Is that a motion? Yeah, I can make a motion. Make a motion. I'll make a motion we forgive that February 16th. I second. I have a motion and a second to forgive the uh, fifth day missed, uh, which is February 16th. Any discussion regarding that? The motion? We've got several principals out there. Anybody want to talk? <laughs> okay. And we still and we still have enough. We still have the hours. Yes. We're over the hours. We, we're over the hours, and so, okay. Okay. No further discussion. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Thank the motion you. carries. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll move to the uh, policy. And again, as we said it early in the meeting, these will be first readings from items I through you. Dr. Cash, members of the board, Mr. Johnson, the, the, the policy for 4,400 that you all have, how many pages do you all have in front of you? 4,400, is it more than two? Three. three. It's three, okay. So we, we've got the local requirements on that, on that one, right? It, it says part of it to like, is it just two with the policy? Are there sections in there about high school, elementary? No. no. Okay. I don't know the, the order for this, but Dr. Cash, this is not the revised copy that's in here. And so I would ask to be able to come back later with the revised copy because we work with uh, our social workers to come up with the revised copy, and it, it was longer, and it, it included more detail to apply to ISS. Is that okay? Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So we hold policy 4400 since we don't have the adequate uh, list there. Let's move on to item J. Uh, and several following, Melanie, I'll, uh, Dr. Taylor, I'll let you present these as you wish. Sure, uh, Dr. Cash, I have uh, items J through O, and these are policies bringing forward. We've talked about these at a CAL meeting several months ago, but coming back tonight for a first reading. Uh, policy 1310-44002, which is uh, addressing parental involvement. It eliminates the requirement for PEPs, personal education plans, and replaces it with language um, that is connected to the MTSS multi-tiered system of support, which we have been putting in place for the last several years. It also adds consent requirement for students independent access to the internet. So parents would have to sign if students were going to have unsupervised access to the internet during the school day. Um, policy 1320-3560 addresses parental involvement and it clarifies some language um, in there, we are not required to offer supplemental services uh, anymore, and so we're going to leave that language in there. That's an optional requirement and some minor um, corrections to terminology in Section B. Uh, policy 2310 addresses public participation in board meetings, and uh, it basically outlines um, how if the superintendent will notify um, participate or requesting parties um, of their request if that's granted and then addresses what should happen if that request were denied and how the board could um, vote and a majority vote that person could be allowed to speak um, if that were the uh, choice of the board. Policy 3405 addresses students at risk of academic failure. Once again, this removes a lot of the language from PEP's personal education plans and replaces it with the multi-tiered system of support language, which is what we have been using in this district uh, for the last several years as well. Uh, policy 3420 addresses student promotion and accountability. Once again, there's language in here that is cleaned up um, in relation to the personal education plans, MTSS. Also under section E, it includes the new language addressing first and second grade uh, students' 
admittance to reading camps and inclusion in those reading camps. Um, policy 3460 addresses graduation requirements and basically this um, eliminates all of our students who are in high school now have the CPR requirement so it just eliminates that start year date because all of our students have that requirement and it cleans up uh, some of the language in, in reference to the current standard course of study and reminds students to consult with their guidance counselors um, as they are looking to verify course requirements. So certainly be glad to answer any questions that you have about those. These policies will sit for 30 days and we will bring them back again in April for a vote. Dr. Taylor, um, on the uh, parental involvement, 1310 slash 4002, um, yes. the, this is um, parental involvement we a few a couple of years ago we did the making responsible choices sexual ed yes. curriculum um, and it is a opt-in which is parental permission required correct is that in this policy that is not included in this policy that is actually included in a separate policy um, and that's actually um, included in the policy I think I brought forward last Monday night for a first reading um, and that policy will need to come here for a first reading, but there were some, I can't remember which policy number it is, but it actually references sexual health and sexual health programs that are opt-in policies. But, then, but this, uh, this policy specifically addresses Title I parent involvement. So it's just Title I parents? Well, let's see, there are two, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, there, there are two, there are two different policies. Hold on. Okay. Well, under, Is it in? <clears throat> under yeah, that's, that's in the parental involvement. Sorry. Okay. You're right. So in um, Section B, um, where did it go? Wait a minute. Purpose. Wait a minute. Mm -mm. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Section C. Mm hmm opportunities to withhold consent opt out uh, number three um, that I thought that was your sexual health uh, component. that is and this is probably two different edits on the same policy that have come forward from the board at two different times yeah mm -hmm. so is there any way you can we can we can actually what we can do is combine those when we bring those forward because that policy um, when we did the last reading and what we may want to do is pull this policy well it's going to come back for a read another reading anyway but we can post it okay. um, but we can we can combine those because they came forward at two different times with two different edits in them okay thank you and then um, oh the um, public participation at board meetings <clears throat> policy 2310 um, um, below the one two three section the red one two three um, does the chair of the board chair have a duty to inform the rest of the board if the chair and the superintendent um, decide to deny a request I mean how does how does the chair and the superintendent um, communicate with the rest of the board I don't think that's outlined in the policy that would be something um, that that you certainly would have to work out logistically um, once this policy is accepted and and Costi you can Mr. Cute you certainly may uh, speak in but if the request is denied the superintendent would explain other processes and upon that request then the board you know the the individual that was denied the um, opportunities to speak could make a request uh, to the board if I'm reading this correctly and the board could by a majority vote um, but I think that would have to be logistics that would have to be worked out it appears if they put it on everything's fine if they deny the request then, then Brady, Mr. Johnson's got to tell you that they denied it, and you all can, by majority vote, say no. We want to hear that anyway. That's how that's how that would happen. All right. And 
one more question. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the graduation requirements, policy 3460. Um, uh, CPR, when is that? Um, when do you recognize that? Can they, ha can they, the student take that in eighth grade and be considered fulfilled? Typically it's taught during the ninth grade health classes, mm -hmm. um, the health and PE classes. And so that is one of the requirements because none of that can be done, my understanding is none of that can be done prior to entering the ninth grade. Health and PE and the requirements for that could not be done through credit by demonstrated mastery. It's one of the courses they actually have to be a part of. And, and it says just that they um, go to class. They don't have to be certified in it um, because I'm thinking, I'm thinking students that may have a disability that can't do the compressions and stuff. Correct, and, and certainly those students would have modifications on their IEP, but there is a requirement. Um, the actual requirement says successful completion of the instruction. There you go. All right, thank you. Next we have items uh, P through U, uh, Dr. Lassane. Good evening. You had these um, items P through U originally presented at the December Committee of the Whole meeting. They are coming back for first reading now. As a matter of, um, just for the record, I'm going to give you some quick um, summations for each one. First of all, you have policy 4040. 7310, which has some substantial changes to this policy. It deals directly with staff and student relations and attempts to really define what is appropriate and inappropriate um, contact between staff and students, particularly when it comes to electronic communications and um, also outlines reporting procedures and different guidelines like that. Um, so you will see the substantial changes to that policy. Next, we have policy 7335, which is employee use of social media. It actually links to the previous policy. And so you're gonna see a lot of changes to that policy that center around um, social media and um, expectations around relationships, social media, communication regarding students, and all of those pieces. So there are some pretty substantial changes to that policy also. The third one on the list is policy 7500, which is workday and um, overtime. And you can see that that includes some minor edits and it removes the word written. Um, seems to be the biggest part of that as part of the acknowledged agreement that every employee um, should be completing with regards to um, workday and overtime. Policy 7730 involves employee conflict of interest. And um, you can see a simple edit um, that is included there under A and that just simply removes that language of engage in selling goods and services to the board and shall not. That's the only piece that is removed from that policy. Policy 7950 is non-career status teachers non-renewal. And you can see the um, incorporation there is the connection or the linkage to the hearings policy so that it aligns with the changes that came from the state board. And policy 7502 is absences and tardiness, and that is based on administrative recommendation. And you will remember we worked extensively with the board attorney for the construction of this policy. And so you can see the recommended changes there to policy 7502. We just spoke on yesterday regarding improvements to attendance attendance and I just um, think that this will help align to um, a lot of the process that you'll find our supervisors are utilizing and also help um, with those processes. Are there any questions regarding any of these policies? 
I just have a process question. Are these posted on our website or how are they posted for feedback? Our board secretary takes care of that piece, I think, with the board items, right? Am I correct on that or incorrect? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then they are sent out to the um, departments that they refer to, whether it's HR, curriculum, operations. So but you mean where are they posted for the, public where does review? Where the public access that? Is it accessed on the website? Is it, where is it? Provisions here? Right. I have not posted them huh. whenever before a meeting. I have not. I know one of the uh, grad students that's in our system had sent a recommendation to me that said, you know, if the public wanted to comment back on these, um, so other school said, I believe Gaston and Catawba both put it on their website. Here are, are revisions, and it gives them a tool there so they can respond back to, to it. Uh, I, I don't know I if that's never, what we've been doing. It was a question I didn't know the answer to. That's one of the reasons I was going to ask. But I think it would be good if we do want to have quality feedback. We need to have opportunity for parents and other staff people and others besides just uh, our internal to come back to give us recommendations. And that may be something we need to work toward. I, I know it may be in an inappropriate place in the middle of these policies, but I think if we could, uh, um, and I don't know if I think we can work on. Yeah, we'll sure take a look at some of those other districts department. and see how they're handling that. Right now, it falls on the responsibility of the citizen to keep up with this meeting and read these minutes and, and then to email us or give us a phone call or something of that nature. So if there's a uh, more convenient way to gather feedback, we'll sure take a look at that. I'll, I'll double check back and get to you with, with those school systems that they recommended. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it's Gaston, I think, was the one that had it on their website. <laughs> I have no questions of what you presented. I, I concur. I think we need to put these out. I think that would have eliminated um, um, back a few months ago with the South Idol ranking thing. I, I think it caught them by surprise, and had they had they been able to access it, you know, which they did somehow. Um, I do have a question on staff student relations, policy 4040 slash 7310. Um, and I know this should be common sense to any adult, especially uh, professional. Um, but is there, um, uh, do we have, all the staff signed their understanding of this policy. Is it in the employee handbook? Um, does it, when an employee gets a handbook, does he or she sign it? Um, this, you know. I would say there's multiple places that it's covered. It's covered in the annual ethics online. And so this will be, once the policy is approved and updated, it will be repopulated into that linkage that's in that document for all staff. We hit it home but during new teacher orientation also. Does the employee sign their understanding? But on the ethics, it's online and they have to do an online signature at the end. Okay, great. Um, and we have actually used that in um, reviews I think of things with yearly. employees. Mm -hmm. In the last few years, I think every yeah. principal should go over this with his or her staff and they on a do. yearly basis um, and then the apps the policy code 7502 absences and tardiness <clears throat> um, and I know you did a lot of work on this one but on the third paragraph um, where it says a, uh, additional absences beyond the employees entitled legally may be granted if such an allowance is determined to be in the best interest of the school dis uh, system, what does that mean? Who grants this? And is it, is it equi equitable? Well, well, generally, that's going to come through superintendent recommendations. So let me see if I can think of, for instance, we have had some, one that comes to mind, some very serious cancer cases in the district. We're literally someone is outside of what is outlined in policy for VSL, they have no leave. And the only thing that they can have is leave without pay, okay? 
So we do have some people in that situation. I can think of some of the workers' comp issues where we end up where people are off, they're still under workers' comp, but it's leave without pay. And whether it's a legal issue or an empathy issue, that paragraph just gives you some, some pieces, some flexibility when you're dealing with that. So let's say um, someone has to be out for an extended period of time due to cancer, they're on leave without pay. Do you decide that as soon as they're, you know, you reach, where is that point? And it may be different for all employees and you kind of have to assess those. For some people, when you tell them that you're separating from them on a job, that could actually carry them in another direction with regards to their health. Part of what has them going is the thought of coming back to that job. That's one um, situation. I have several employees in mind with that that actually ran out of leave beyond BSL, and that was a situation, and they actually did make it back and return to work. Now, you can separate from an employee and have them reapply and go through that process. That just opens up some flexibility, but outside of that, I would have to defer to the attorney um, for um, additional assessment of why you would want to leave that paragraph in there or take it out. And this would not, um, FMLA would not apply to your scenario. This is beyond FMLA. That F it, This would be before FMLA, because don't you have to be employed a year before you get FMLA? Yeah, you have to be, but FMLA would be considered the legal leave. So you're saying you've exhausted that legal leave. Okay. So if it's actually someone who qualifies for legal leave, they've already used up FMLA, mm -hmm. what they were granted through FMLA. So you're saying when they extinguish all leave mm -hmm. and they move into the leave without pay, at that point you can either choose to uh, expunge them from the system or you can leave them on the system long enough for them to come back. Exactly. Without having any repercussion right. against the employee and, because they'll come back and they're still on next. And I have a case I'm working with right now in which the attorney has advised that we leave the person. We were looking to separate. They're without leave. They're on leave without pay. And the attorney advised because of other things, you have things like tenure that you have to do. I mean, you have lots of other things that you have to consider. So that would be an example that you would kind of be in this last paragraph um, with, that advent, um, with that individual. And just because of all of the factors, our attorney is saying you need to leave them as your employee. They're off payroll, but they're still our employee. And maybe the new health laws may actually, where they said, you hire after a certain date, if you were to get distinguished and you had to reapply, you may, there may be a loophole. I don't know what's going to happen there to those employees. So if you extinguish... You have lots of consideration. And you had to go over the time, and all of a sudden they took you off the board, you had to reapply to be a teacher again, you may not have that luxury. It gives them the opportunity to hold on to good employees. And particularly when you're dealing with things like people who are grandfathered in for tenure, you have to be very, very careful with those because if you separate from them and they reapply, then guess what? That tenure is gone. And so when you're making those steps, you have to make sure that those are made very carefully. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Next, next we'll move on. Uh, the next few policies, which are second readings and require a vote, uh, they all fall under Melissa Wyke's guards. Uh, I'll let you present those how you want to. Okay, if it's okay with the board, I'll just do them all at one time. Um, number V through Z, um, they were all very simple changes that were recommended by the School Boards Association. Most of the policy changes um, inserted wording relating to the Leandro case and the duties of the board to provide um, an appropriate education to all students. Um, if you want questions answered about individual policies, I'd be happy to do that, but that's in general the changes for all of the policies listed up with my name beside them. And this is the second reading and is ready for vote. Any questions for Melissa? Other questions?
questions when someone's ready for a motion. Uh, we'll entertain a motion to approve these. I'll make a motion that we accept uh, Mrs. Black's recommendations for the policies V through Z. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Kelly, I think, get first on that. Um, any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Ms. White. That concludes our non-consent agenda. We're now ready for a public comment. Uh, we had a few people signed to speak tonight. Uh, they're still here. I apologize for this first name I may mispronounce, but uh, Nagwa Motadi. Yes. Thank you. How close did I get to that? No, you pronounced it. Thank you. <laughs> Just again to clarify, uh, Rose, I guess the, uh, before we start, uh, ask that you state your name and the general purpose uh, that you're going to make tonight, and then we ask that each uh, comment be three minutes or less. To it. And right. We will not directly address you back tonight uh, per se, but we'll take that into consideration. Thank you. That's Thank my you. first time. Okay. Uh, my name is Nagwa Motaji, and my son, uh, he's a junior in Lake Norman High School. And we're here today regarding uh, two complaints. Uh, the first one, that my uh, son, name is Omar Muhtaji, was subject to a bullying, discrimination, and humiliation, and mental abuse for the past three years by Mr. Brandon Jolly, the varsity basketball coach. Our second issue here is regarding the mandatory donation that Mr. Jolly has been collecting from the player and the team manager over the years. Those donation was a thousand of dollar. However, the parent were never given any explanation as or how the money was being spent. The treasurer of the poster club is a parent of a student who left the school three years ago. We have been asking to see the poster club budget multiple times, but we only have been given one document which doesn't say anything. We went through all the appropriate channel to express our concern, starting with the coach himself, the athletic director, the principal, and finally, Mr. Armstrong, which he did a great investigation for us, but still we don't know the result. All we know that they promote the coach, he's not only the basketball coach, but now also the golf varsity team coach. And we like to know what's happening with our complaint. This, um, my name is Khalid Motadi. I'm Omar's father. Um, we've lived here since 2006, and my son Omar has been going through the school system from Woodland Heights and grew up with all the kids that he goes to school uh, at Lake Norman. Um, we've waited three years to make this complaint, and I've coached uh, these children for the last 10 years and I know of this bullying, humiliation, discrimination, and mental abuse has been going on for 10 years. There are kids that are seniors in college that have complained to me and their parents have complained about this, but they were too afraid or they tried to get uh, Coach Jolly removed and was uh, unable to. Um, the rest of the documentation was Mr. Armstrong. He has all the investigation. We've been working with him for the, last, for the past two months. And he interviewed every player on the team and the coaches and he, okay, that's it. Oh, I don't know. So I don't know if, oh. uh, we just wanna know where, where, where we're going with this. Like, no one wants to give us any answer. Like, I understand Mr. Armstrong did a great job and he did recommendation, but he told me he's not allowed to tell me about the recommendation and he's not allowed to tell me about the result, him or the principal. Okay, there's only five seconds left. So the transparency for the, for the uh, booster club and also, as you are all aware of, five members of the basketball team quit and the other five uh, wanted to quit, but either their parents wouldn't let them or they were afraid literally seniors crying on the bench during games. This is the type of abuse that's been going on for many, many years. And if this doesn't get resolved, it will happen on and on for the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you for your comments. 
Our next uh, speaker is Heather Griffin. She, Ms. Griffin, she, she lead? Yeah. Okay. All right, and then uh, we have one final listed here, Scott Klontz. <clears throat> Dr. Cash, Mr. Johnson, members of the board, um, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you. I'm Scott Klontz. Uh, had missed uh, about six months of attending uh, Committee of the Whole meetings and got to attend last week. and. The more things change, the more they stay the same. It uh, often surprises me how professionals can uh, come into a job and express the fact that they didn't understand the direction that they were given. Um, we had a lot of discussion last week about technology. Um, I think Mr. Uh, James brought up uh, some transparency issues that we should try to aspire with the public. I think uh, Ms. Bonham always comes up with... Uh, the comment that if you got an issue, come up with a solution. So the solution is this. Videotape your committee of the whole meetings. Provide the information to the public. It's simple. We could even make it a senior project or use the uh, CATS program with audio video. Uh, video. Um, I think this meeting should be uh, uh, broadcast to the public through the uh, same avenues that the uh, county commission does through streaming, actually through PCs. You can't get it on, can't get it on Apple. Um, Mr. James himself brought up as recently as tonight the discussion about uh, policies and those uh, types of things that should be available to the public. Mr. James, they, were, they used to be available. You used to be able to click on a, at least on a PC, click on a policy number most of the time, and that document that you have in front of you would, would show up uh, for the public. So it has happened in the past. The other thing that uh, should take place is that the agenda uh, should be included in the minutes. Um, for some odd reason, on Tuesday morning after a committee of the whole meeting or a, a regular board meeting, if somebody wanted to know what they missed last night because they forgot it was the first Monday of the, of the, of the month, uh, it's gone. So it's not available. Um, I remember very well that uh, Mr. Kelly uh, confronted me in the back of this room uh, one night, and I, I think the terminology was something related to an email that I sent, and, and his statement started out with the phrase, boy. And um, I thought it was quite unique last week how he um, expressed a, a discontent with the board of communicating through email, but then uh, not 20 minutes later in the discussion, he made it, statements so important that we should not regress 10 years with technology. If we want our children to, to, to grab onto technology and, and uh, live with it and achieve with it and make great strides with it, we as board members and parents and members of the community should also strive to, to use that technology. And I think email right now is the way to go. Thank you for your time. I appreciate your service. Thank you. That concludes the, uh, the list of those who had uh, signed to speak tonight. I'll ask if any other members in the audience uh, wish to speak to the board. If not, we have time for board member comments now. Uh, Mr. Page, I believe you said you wanted to make comments. Yes, sir, please. Uh, this is a new form that we're placing in most of our classrooms. Uh, I've seen them all around the schools. And it talks about high ethical standards of transparency uh, as one of our values. It talks about openness and we operate in a transparent manner. Well, Mr. Chairman, I felt that your comment at last Monday night's meeting of the whole was very damaging to the public perception of transparency in our system. You told the staff they should not answer questions from individual school board members. I really don't think you have the legal authority to to instruct the staff not to answer questions from anyone, much less board members. Our system has made a big public relations push to improve the perception of openness and transparency. Your comment just reinforced most people's belief that it is that, a perception, not a reality. Since being elected to the board almost two years ago, I've challenged the openness and transparency of our administration many times. I have seen some improvement in our openness, Board leadership has cr criticized me many times for asking too many questions. 
I remember early on I was told, and I'm going to quote this, I should not ask questions because the administration will tell us everything we need to know, unquote. I do ask questions. I think it's the duty of elected officials to ask questions. If all we're supposed to do is rubber stamp everything the administration wants, then why do we even need a school board? We were elected to represent the people, the taxpayers of our district. Asking questions is our job. Most of my formal requests for information were by email. In the past six months, I've emailed 21 requests for information from our staff. 13 of those went to the superintendent and board chair, and only eight requests for information went to members of the general staff. That's in the last six months. Now, I've also asked staff many questions in person. I'm often in the schools and support offices, keeping up with what's going on, talking to the staff. And in our conversations, I'm sure I ask questions. But generally, if I want f formal information, something in writing, a copy of something, I'll ask that by email. I feel the best way to make good decisions are to be well-informed board members. And I have copies of my emails if anyone from the, any citizen or media would like to see them. Thank you. Any other board members like to make comments? I, I would like to um, make a comment also regarding what Mr. Page has talked about. I know Mr. Page has been in this system for a long time. Um, you know, he's very comfortable with picking up the phone and, and calling department heads. Um, what I would like to say is there's a big difference in calling a employee um, and calling as a board member. Um, I concur with Mr. Cash that most questions, most questions need to be directed through Brady, you know, for these reasons. Um, not that it's been abused as far as time is concerned, but um, certain board members have a tone in their voice when questioning employees, and it's perceived as an interrogation or a gotcha kind of thing. Um, it could be perceived as, um, you know, coming across very brash, uh, gruff and demanding. Um, I believe that the questions need to go through Mr. Johnson because he is responsible to the board. If he's not doing his job, um, then we have the choice of terminating this contract. He needs to be made aware of what employees are doing uh, for outside folks and how much time it entails um, to answer that question. Um, I know that the county commissioners, when they take, when they take on an issue, um, they take it on through Ron Smith, the county manager, not necessarily calling each department head. Rarely ever do they do that. Only um, they send everything through the county manager when it entails a countywide issue. And so, you know, I knew that set you off in the, in the committee of the whole meeting. And I just wanted to say, I understand where you're coming from because you have been an employee for a long time and it's just so much, it's so much easier. But I want you to understand the perception that it gives um, to the employees that's one of the big things. But also the big thing is Brady is supposed to be handling all those issues. And it needs all the information needs to flow through him. If he's not doing his job, you know, we'll know it pretty quick. Any other comments? Now let me let me let me let me jump. Okay. Uh yeah, hold me back. Okay. I need water. Um I, I can almost grin because this is classic. We start on one topic. I thought Mr. Page was going to address questioning. And we go from that topic to email to Mr. Johnson to a cow meeting to what we're doing here, what we're supposed to be doing, and how we're supposed to be doing it. So we're off on multiple things all at one time, and we don't really get to a solution on any one thing, which might be some of the problem, but, you know, I thought about, you know, when people ask questions, and I've made this statement several times, I can set this, I make this statement and set it aside. 
we're going to get into trouble with emails. Sooner or later, we're going to get killed, and I wish we would stop doing that. You can send an email to anybody, but if it makes it sound official, we're going to get into trouble. That's aside. Then, a lot of times, to switch to another topic, the questioning. When the questioning starts, I don't know where the questions are coming from. If a certain person is asking a question, where is that question coming from? If Mr. Page is asking a question, for example, has he talked to someone? Uh, has he talked to a principal? Has he talked to a student? Has he talked to, where is it coming from? What's the source? And are you mad? Half the time, I'm looking at some people asking questions. Are you mad? Are you mad to start with? Did you come in at number 10 instead of number one? Why are you doing that? Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, I made a list of things. I get the impression a lot of times when we start asking questions, I'm just on one topic. You, you're asking questions, you don't like them? You're asking questions because you don't like them. You give the impression you don't like them. You, don't, you get the impression that you don't like that program, so you're questioning that program to death, or you really want to shut that program down. Is that the object of the 37 questions, is to shut that program down? I, I can't believe that would be the problem. Or... Is there some secret somewhere that nobody knows but the question asker? Are you asking a question because you have a secret that only you know or they know that you're trying to bring out, but you don't want to say it, but you don't want them to say it, but you want the secret brought out? Now, I don't understand that. And then you don't trust anybody? You don't trust anybody about anything at any time, any place, anywhere. I wonder if that's the motives for some of the question. Or, in a sense, 99 times out of 100, a set of 38, 39, 42 questions doesn't really change the outcome of what is being presented. Are we just listening to ourselves talk? And all that's related to the questioning, not anything else, just the questioning. Brief, just one brief one, and I don't know if the newspaper is still here, but um, several employees, we've talked about this, about having a fear of who's up here across the board, but I just want all of our employees to know, uh, whether it's the janitor to the top of the line, that they all have the right to come to this board and speak without no repercussion or retaliation, because I've heard it more and more times, can you do so-and-so? And I guess it's because I worked here too, it's like Martin and maybe closer to some of them been in the county government, but when they say, I don't want to come to the meeting because I know if I do, I'll be marked and I'll be looked at, whatever, but they, read, they need to realize that they can come to any board meeting we have, speak to us and talk to us, and there is no, as long as I'm sitting on the board, there'll be no repercussion, retaliation, or anybody will be fired for speaking to this board. And I spent 35 years of my life in that flag defending that right, and I'll just be, and I won't say what I want to say, but I'll say it nicely. They will have that right, and they will not be fired, and they will not be retaliated against. If they are, then you need to come and tell me about it. I will not stand for that. And I can, I'll stamp that and also say that, and I know we don't say this often enough, I don't know how many people we have in this system. Maybe Johnson, can you tell me how many professional people classified, how many people we have? You are the CEO of the largest organization in the county. How many people is that? 2,700 2, people. Mm -hmm. I challenge anybody on this board or anybody in this room or anybody connected with this association to go find any one of those people that's any more important than any other, by, any other of the 2,700. Mm -hmm. We appreciate the work that every single person does in this organization. Everything that everybody contributes to any accolade that we might get, anything that the Idle Stasteful system gets or is t touted for, to all 2,700 of those people are involved in, getting doing, in doing that and doing it so well 
that everybody in surrounding counties and surrounding states are looking at it. And if we don't say it often enough, I'm sorry, but I appreciate all 2,700, and I appreciate what they do from the time they start to the time they end, and some of them have long, long hours, and they work very, very hard at what they do. Whatever they do, whatever level they're on, whatever, the, whatever their title is, they're all important, and I appreciate every single one of them. And I wish this room was full every night. We have a meeting. I, I tell them, if you don't come, then you don't know sometimes what's going on. So, and like you said a while ago, Dr. Cash, you know, everybody leaves. We have just our staff. So sometimes I like preaching to the choir again. But, yeah, I've told them, come, come to the meetings. Come see what's going on. Maybe boring, maybe exciting. I don't know. But please come sometimes. Thank you. Comments? Go to our superintendent comments then, Ms. Johnson. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Cash, members of the board. Um, <clears throat> tonight we didn't talk about your budget, but uh, last Monday night at the Cal meeting, you guys did approve your um, local current expense budget request to the county commissioners. That was delivered uh, to the uh, county manager's office Friday uh, last week. That is a six percent uh, increase in over this year's funding, uh, well over $2 million. Um, I will say that uh, when we had our discussion last week, um, we were a little bit concerned about whether or not that was gonna be uh, too high. <laughs> um, I heard from my colleagues down in Mooresville but that their request was 12%, so I don't think the commissioners will get sticker shock when they see our 6%. Um, we did embed in that as you requested. Um, some additional support uh, for our, what the state of North Carolina is referring to, low performing schools. Uh, there is a quarter uh, cent, uh, a quarter of 1% uh, increase to our local supplement. Uh, there are uh, increases in there for what we have been told is going to be a 6% raise uh, from the state of North Carolina. So, that budget does deserve a, a good hard look and we will be posting that online and next month at this meeting we will be conducting a public hearing on your local budget so we do invite the public and our staff members to study that budget and to come out next month and uh, that is a statutory requirement and we certainly hope that they'll take advantage of that and give you feedback on that budget then of course we will be going to the commissioners to uh, present that budget and defend uh, the recommendation and we'll communicate with you as soon as that date has been established. Um, the next item, uh, I want to just very briefly comment on our uh, mid-year review that was held yesterday afternoon. Um, and I want to thank uh, Representative Fraley uh, who attended that meeting along with uh, Commission Chairman Mallory. Uh, we did have some other uh, folks that um, sent regrets. Uh, Representative Turner could not be there because she was traveling out of the country on state business. And um, Commissioner Norman was uh, uh, communicated with us and he was a, at a funeral yesterday and could not be there. But we certainly want to thank them for their interest. I thought it was a very good, healthy discussion uh, that we had. And I'd like to just focus very quickly on uh, the legislative priorities that we presented. You know, we got a little bogged down there at one time and didn't get through the whole list. So just for the record and for the folks that might watch this uh, video in the future, uh, uh, the um, North Carolina Association of School Administrators have, have identified what they consider as five priorities for the General Assembly. And so let me just touch on those real quickly. One is low performing schools and the school performance grades. The General Assembly made a decision several years to go, to go with an A through F report card in North Carolina. And so that's, that debate is over and that decision has been made. At the time that that debate was going on, we did raise a red flag and, and uh, ask the state to be very careful of, about that. We are not a bit afraid of accountability. And as, as teachers and educators, we realize that giving grades is part of the educational process. And so we welcome that accountability. 
Uh, what we were concerned about with the A through F report card had to do with the over-identification of poverty and kids that were struggling due to circumstances that were absolutely beyond their control. And so our worst fears were realized when the grades came out and we've done an excellent job in North Carolina of identifying where our kids that live in poverty go to school. Uh, the big question now is uh, we've identified these schools, so what are we going to do to support them? So a couple of things that, that we would like for the General Assembly to take a look at is, number one, the fairness of that uh, A through F report card and possibly taking a look at the formula. If uh, the A through F report card continues in its present uh, status, then next year there, there's a great chance that there will be over 1,000, 1,200 low-performing schools in North Carolina. And as a state, how are we going to market ourselves nationally and internationally when we're uh, mislabeling our schools and, and calling them failures? Uh, this has been demoralizing to teachers. Uh, it has put extreme pressure on administrators. Um, and so what we're hoping that the General Assembly will do this year is to come back and take a look at possibly rewarding uh, schools that are making growth with their students. Uh, rather than just a pure look at, at uh, how you did on a, a final exam, that state, that state test, uh, let's take a look at how those kids arrive in the fall of the year and where that teacher took those kids by May or June. So we're hoping the General Assembly will take a look at that formula. The second area that we hope the General Assembly will take a hard look at this year is compensation for educators. You know, we applaud what the General Assembly did over the last two years in uh, raising pay for beginning teachers. Beginning teachers in North Carolina now have moved from thirty-three dollars to $35,000 a year, and that's a great start. But along the line, we have forgotten about our veteran teachers, and we've also forgotten about our classified employees, the folks that drive our buses and clean our buildings and, and the, the electricians and the plumbers and the mechanics at the bus garage. We forgot those people. Other state employees did get raises, and so this year we are asking the General Assembly to take a look at all of the people that serve the children throughout this uh, state and our, and our local community. And there needs to be um, a significant increase uh, to address the gap that started way back in 2009. The third area that we're hoping the state will take a look at this year is just the overall funding formula for public education. We have not recovered to the point that we were in before the recession. And so you hear lots of folks talk about the budget and that we are spending lots of lots of money on education, 52% of the state budget goes to education. I hope that we can start beginning to look at education as an investment in the life of a child and an investment in the livelihood of a community. And um, it's, it's, it is an expenditure, but it is also an investment in individual children and the communities that invest in education generally have higher standard of living and, and they are more economically vi vital. The fourth area is accountability in school choice options. Now the debate again was held several years ago about lifting the cap on charter schools and so that debate is over. Um, we expressed some opinions about that at the time and raised some caution flags but North Carolina has embraced the school choice movement. And you know what? So has the Iredell State School Schools. And I do commend this Board of Education because you guys have funded and put in place some absolutely phenomenal school choice options for the citizens in this community. And if you look at any one of those, all of those school choice options, they are at capacity with a waiting list to get in. So I hope in the future that we will be able to continue to add school choice options. The one thing that we're hoping the General Assembly will take a look at, though, is the fairness in the uh, current model that is used in North Carolina. I'm a big believer, too, in deregulation. Take away as many government restrictions and controls as you possibly can. 
But right now in North Carolina, there's two sets of standards. There's a standard for public schools, and then there's a standard for charter schools. So we have always said, give us the same flexibility that you give to charter schools. And that's in hiring, that's in using our budgets, that's in setting your calendar, curriculum flexibility. Just level that playing field. And so we do hope that the General Assembly will address that this year. The last area has to do with teacher licensure. And unfortunately, we have created a situation in North Carolina where there is a severe teacher shortage, particularly in certain areas, hard to fill areas like math and science and EC and some vocational education areas. So what we're trying to convey to the state is to allow us to have flexibility when it comes to hiring teachers. Here's, here's a great example. Our, um, our school board attorney is uh, licensed by the state of North Carolina to practice law, but, but he could not go to Statesville High School and teach civics. We need to be able to use a little bit of common sense when it comes to hiring folks particularly because of the teacher shortage. And there are some retirees, there are people that are changing careers for whatever that would consider coming into education if we would take some of the roadblocks uh, out of their pathway. So we do hope that uh, the General Assembly this year will help us address the teacher shortage by giving us flexibility in the area of licensure and who we hire and put into our classrooms. Um, that's enough about politics. I, I want to close out my comments tonight with a story. I had a teacher come see me last week, and she was just absolutely beside herself, and she, she wanted to tell me a story about one of her former students who graduated from one of our high schools. And so if we could click on uh, that first picture up there, and this picture will not do justice, but the teacher was telling me about this young man and uh, for, to protect his privacy, I won't mention his name or where he's in school or whatnot, but he, did, he graduated last year, last June, from one of our high schools. That's a picture of him in his dorm room. And uh, when he got to college, and he is attending one of the University of North Carolina schools, um, that young man was a national merit finalist and, and won a full ride to one of our universities in North Carolina. His teachers took that picture. His teachers helped him move in uh, the day of college graduation. His teachers helped him uh, go to the school and take his entrance exams and, and all that kind of stuff. So he was supported uh, by his teachers every step of the way. And uh, since he's been there, he's a 4.0 Dean's List student. Uh, he's actually received a notice from a neighboring uh, university and they tried to lure him away to come to their university and he's, he's holding true to his, to his first offer. His goal is he wants to go into medicine. And so Chapel Hill has already contacted him and told him, said, look, when you, when you finish that undergraduate degree, you come to Chapel Hill, we've got a spot for you in medical school. Uh, so it's just a phenomenally successful student and a heartwarming story, but I can't overemphasize the fact that this young man beat the odds and he was supported by his teachers tremendously. Now let's click on another picture and I'll show you where he came from. This young man uh, spent his entire school career here in the Iredell Statesville school system. Unfortunately, his dad was in prison, his mom struggled with substance abuse. And um, yeah, that's all right. Uh, when I saw this, and this picture does not do justice to this. Uh, I've got it on my telephone if you'd like to see a better picture. That's the home that he grew up in. And as these teachers was telling me this kid's story, I thought about public education. And we're, we're in a big debate now in North Carolina about charter schools and all this kind of stuff. And I, I just, I'm reminded by this young man's story that public education is one of the cornerstones of our democracy. It is the pathway out of poverty, like this young man right here. 
And no other school can say that. Private schools, charter schools, they can't say that. But we do reach out to every corner of this community, and we do, as the Constitution of North Carolina requires us to do, offer no strings attached, a free appropriate public education to every child, regardless of his zip code, his condition, who his parents are, no matter what life struggles he might be facing. And uh, the teachers who came by to share this story with me last week were just absolutely uh, committed to this concept of public education. And what a success story. I hope one of these days to bring this young man here to meet you and to let him do a presentation and tell you about what the Iredell Statesville Schools means to him personally, particularly the teachers that served him and rescued him from this life-changing uh, circumstances that he grew up in. Thanks, Dr. Cash. Thank you. Well, that concludes our agenda for tonight's meeting. Uh, <clears throat> we'll need to go into closed session here in a few moments to discuss the uh, personnel portion that we uh, delayed until after uh, closed session. But before we go, we'll just uh, have you notice the dates on the screen for upcoming uh, holidays and events. March 28th is a holiday. March 29th and 30th are annual leave days. March 31st and April 1st are optional teacher work days. April 4th will be our next Committee of the Whole meeting at the ADR Education Center, 6 p.m. And April 11th will be our next Board of Education meeting here at the Iredell County Government Center at 6 p.m. That being said, if there are no other announcements, so I'll entertain a motion that we go into closed session to discuss personnel. I remember next um, next Monday, March 21st at 6 o'clock, and I don't have that in front of me, Cindy. You gave it to me yesterday, but um, Brady's a guest speaker at the Child Evangelism Fellowship yeah. Banquet. This is an annual fundraiser right. that is held to support the Good News Clubs that are operating in 12 of our 17 elementary schools. It'll be next Monday at 6 o'clock, I believe, at Civic Center. Yes, sir. Great. Mr. Chairman, according to the North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11, I make a motion that the board enter into closed session to discuss personnel issue uh, and to preserve the attorney client attorney client privilege. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Uh, okay, we'll move into closed session then. Thank you again.